Okay, so we'll keep this kind of, it's a small group, so it's pretty informal. I don't want to just chat at you the whole time. So if you have any questions, stop me. Um, if I need to clarify anything, feel free to ask questions. Um, and then if I ask a question, if you could participate, that'd be awesome instead of staring at me. <laughs> It'll make it better. So today we're talking about diabetes. So what do, what do you guys know about diabetes? Everybody in my family has it. Everyone in your family has it, okay? My dad's not everybody. Okay. Sugar. Sugar. What else do we know about it? Don't want it. Don't want it. <laughs> Perfect. Do we, what do you want to learn about diabetes today? If it really comes from sugar or if it comes from meat, like how that Netflix documentary said. Okay. That's good to know. Okay. We'll clarify that for you. Did you have a question? Uh, just, you know, how much weight is considered acceptable for somebody who has type 2 diabetes? Oh, okay. That's a good one. That's not in there, so I'll add that in. I was That's why I on. ask. Yeah. Anything else that you want to make sure I do cover? Okay, if you see something that triggers, just, just ask as we go. So today we'll kind of talk about what diabetes actually is. Because it's funny, when I say that, you know, we talk about it, nobody actually knows usually what diabetes actually is. Um, the types of it, and um, how we find out if we have it, and then what do we do once we know we have it. So there is a very fancy definition a group of metabolic diseases characterized by hyperglycemia resulting from defects in insulin secretion. You understand that, right? Exactly what that means? Yeah, totally. Yeah. So um, when it comes to diabetes, it's pretty much how your body functions with the sugar we put in it. So if it works properly, then we don't have it. If not, then there's usually different variations of how our, our body handles that sugar. So we'll kind of break it down. So a normal body with the food, the drinks, a lot of people forget that, the drinks we put in our system, anything that has sugar in it, it's able to go into our bloodstream. It's taken away from and cells and used as energy. So if you work out, especially if you do any weight training, anything like that, running, this is where you get that energy from and when our body is working normally. But there's a different story when it comes to actually having diabetes. So this is when the pancreas either makes too much or no in, or too little or no insulin, or it doesn't properly use the sugar we actually put in it. So it gets filtered from we eat it, it gets filtered into our pancreas. Our pancreas says, oh, do I understand what this is, how to use it, how to use it properly, and um, gets rid of it and moves it into their cells. This also is a place that if we don't utilize that sugar once it gets out of our system, that's when it starts storing as fat and triglycerides in your cholesterol. And, you know, sometimes you have a conversation with your doctor and they say, if you can lose so much weight, you might actually be able to get off your medications or you might be able to not be diabetic anymore. Um, this is where that comes from because it depends on what we're storing our sugars in. So, so the issues and problems. So either our body doesn't make any insulin it doesn't make enough or you use it properly, which is what I just discussed. So tell me, do you know the types of diabetes that there are? Yeah, types one and two. Types one and two? Okay. No, there's more than that. There's more than two, right? There, there's technically three yeah. kinds. There's types one, two, and gestational, which means when you're pregnant. So none of you should have that. <laughs> what about the chelocytosis? Ketoacidosis usually comes from mostly in type 2 is when you find out you have ketoacidosis because you are building up so much sugar that you find it in your kidneys and your urine and all of that. Um, that's why one of those will kind of go through some symptoms. You know, you urinate a little bit more often and stuff like that Hello. if you have it. Hello. Welcome. Hello. If you guys have a sign in yet, we've got a sign in. Let's go around. Yeah, make sure you guys all get counted. So tell me, what is type 1 diabetes? Type 1 is the, the kind that I think people are normally born with, and that's where your pancreas is just not making enough uh, insulin. Okay. At some point it was known as like juvenile diabetes because it's mostly in kids when you're diagnosed. Um, so then type 2? Lifestyle. Onset. Onset. Yeah, it usually comes. Usually lifestyle can affect that. Um, 
surprisingly, and that's why they kind of chose me to come talk today, I'm a type 2 diabetic. Uh -huh. So you don't can't book you know you can't judge book by their cover you don't really know I come from a wonderful family of gentlemen who get to hand that down to me so I have a grandfather and a dad who have um, shared this with me so um, I kind of understand especially that side a little bit more I found out actually working with health designs starting with them we were doing our trainings for the screenings. And we were doing like we were practicing looking at our meters, um, yep, checking them out, seeing what um, how to do the finger sticks. And I kept coming up high, and I'm like, that's weird. Where did that come from? So after several times of doing that, I realized that I probably need to go check it out. One of the tests that we'll talk about in a minute, I went and did, and found out yes, I am a type. They thought I would be type one because I was in my early 20s, and they thought there's no way that this can be type two. Putting insulin in my body did not work, so we um, went another route and found out through my blood test that I was type 2. I went home, decided to test my dad, who had been denying this for a very long time, and he obviously had come up pretty pretty high too in his blood sugar. So we got all diagnosed at once, and then his dad decided to tell us then, oh yeah, they told me that a couple years ago. I'm like, <laughs> okay, great. So things that we, we've kind of learned. Um, another thing, and I think we'll go through it in a few minutes, but with gestational, so if any of your wives, girlfriends have ever been pregnant and they've had this test um, to figure out if their blood sugars are high, and women who have gestational diabetes, they have a likelihood of being able to form it again later. Um, once you deliver your baby, it goes away almost immediately, but it does make you prone to having it again. So prediabetes, we hear this a lot, especially probably when you come through the screenings or with your physicians. Um, there is 86 million people that have prediabetes right now. This is where like our lifestyles have gotten us, the food that we're eating, the amount of just carbohydrates and sugar and just all the stuff that we're doing, lack of exercise, sedentary lifestyles are getting us. So um, when we're doing our screenings, we are really seeing a lot of people with just these borderline numbers and you probably hear that, like we'll ask, like have you been fasting? This is what your number is. Where, um, what did you eat last night? What did you eat last? Because we'll just see it just off the numbers, and we'll go through what those numbers are. Um, they're just a little higher than normal, um, not high enough to be diabetes yet. And a lot of times that your physician tries not to label you until they have to and give you a chance to get that under control first. Um, insulin resistance and maybe prevented or delayed. I've seen a lot of people that can kind of work it off before they have to be on medication. It's just a 5 to 7% body weight difference that can get you from having to be on medication. 5 to 7%, that's really not a lot, um, especially in men, because you can probably drop sodas and drop 5 to 7% of your body fat. <laughs> you know, just small things like that, not eating out one meal a day or bringing your lunches would make a big difference. Um, getting exercise for 30 minutes, five days a week, as little as walking is all that they want to see. Something that you might be able to still talk through, but you're not going to be able to sing and have like full conversations. But just getting your heart rate up, just you know, 30 minutes a day, or yeah, a day for five days a week. So, which is better, 30 minutes a day for five days a week, or an hour three times a week? Is it about you know, total time, or is it about it? Actually, work? now it's showing that it's total time. Because it even, you can split this into two 15s a day as well. So let's say you walk your dog and you do a 15-minute walk in the morning, a 15-minute walk in the afternoon. It's showing the same amount of benefit as if you're getting. Um, now, it is showing that if you're doing it at high intensity, that you the higher, like if you're getting to the point that you cannot breathe while you exercise, you can't have a conversation, you're not getting any more benefit than the person who's doing um, just a moderate exercise. So you can do that, but... To a certain extent, you get to a point that you're just working off all the energy in your body. And you're not working in much else after that um, because people are just going hard and fast and hoping it all counts real fast. It doesn't. It actually works better if you kind of split it up a little bit more. What are you doing on in the weekends? What do you do what? Exercise only on the weekends. Like That's better than nothing. I'd rather you get anything than nothing. So if weekends is when you can get it, then yeah, if you can make it, you know, an hour you know, like an hour long walk or you're swimming or anything like that, then that would be better than nothing. Questions? 
Are you anybody getting this much exercise at this point? Yes. Time wise, yeah. Time wise, okay. Yeah, well, so yeah, when you can fit it in. More than that, yeah. Okay. So that's what a lot of people have a hard time. Is it exercise or is it diet that is harder? Do you think? Diet. 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 Okay. Is it because you're like on the go and you're like food, good. food just tastes good? <laughs> All right. Hey, that's fair. It's truthful. Food tastes good. Like some people work out so they can eat, right? Like that's how that works. But unfortunately, um, I, you know, I got to go to the Jags game last night and I ate a ton of stuff that I really shouldn't have. Um, but that means I have to go exercise today. But um, food does taste good. But at the same time, like. I like to look at it more of like an 80-20 plan, 80% of the time, which is usually my, my work days. I can plan out, bring my lunch, have my dinners planned, and then the weekends I have time for whatever I want. But not really, because I have I do have the diabetes, so I have to figure out in my you know family what's going on and keep an eye on that. Like this morning, I brought my meter, and I was like, okay. I was like, I'm going to check this out. I'm going to see where I'm at today to see if I want to show you guys. I probably don't want to show you guys after last <laughs> night. Um, I went back and took some more medicine, and I was like, okay, I'm really a bad example this morning, but um, we'll see what what happens. But going back really quick on yeah. the high intensity, if yeah. it's all about 150 minutes, right. is it, isn't it still better to get it in high intensity mode versus just, say, a walking mode, or it doesn't really matter? It's more about it depends on what you're wa wanting out of it. So yeah. if you want like weight loss, yes, the high intensity is good. You're going to get the same um, benefits for your body even at a minimum of 30 minutes walking. So that's what they're trying to say. Like if you want to go above and beyond, you mm -hmm. can. If you want to, if you want weight loss, or if you're trying to put on muscle, or if you're doing stuff like that. But what is difficult is that we're really trying to get people to even. Because it's they, so hard. Sitting they at say after about 60 minutes of working yeah. out, your muscles fatigue. Right, you're, you're not doing point, anything. You're not doing anything. So right. after it, it's 60, 70 minutes tops, mm -hmm. after 70 minutes, you're you're not doing you're, You show no muscle. Your muscles are totally fatigued at that point. You, you're doing nothing. That's like There's the no same, like, I, like my husband has started to run. I did a half marathon one. Said I did it, um, but I, I trained up to that. But when you're running that far, like you have to take extra stuff with you, so you're eating in the middle. You're giving your body energy because if not, you're just depleting yourself of everything that you have. So your muscles aren't doing much, but just getting exhausted. Um, it's not really helping them build up because there's nothing to build. And then um, it does help probably with weight loss if you have that extra energy to lose. Um, but at the same, but that's time, why also like you'll see a lot of runners that will burn. From doing so much running, mm -hmm. they'll burn a lot of fat through. They'll actually they'll muscles, burn their muscles. Right. right. You'll see their arms are skinny as can be, but they'll still have that belly fat right there, because they've lost all the weight, all their muscles that their body is using. They, they're beyond fatigue. Mm -hmm. So now their body's eating into their muscle, into their core, and you're not actually. Yeah. No so when you're overly running like that, right? Right. Yeah. yeah you gotta, <laughs> you gotta watch out for that. So yeah, that, that it's not that there's a. I just wouldn't probably do more than 60 minutes. There's not much benefit to it is what they're saying. So, like, if you're going to say you only have two days to exercise, 150 minutes, well, you don't need to, like, you know, cram it all in in one 150-minute exercise. Bike ride, you could. Well, I mean, like, I'm yeah. accumulating usually 100 miles, 110 on a week in a bicycle. Okay. Yeah, and... Another thing with that is if you're bicycling, you can also bring right. some of those like energy packs yes. and stuff like that. So as long as you're refueling your body, then it'll go longer. But um, so there's different ways to be diagnosed with diabetes. So has anybody had experience of how to do any of these? How to do the test to be screened for diabetes? Is that you know, part of our annual screening? One is part of your annual screening. I'm borderline uh, hypoglycemic. Oh, you're the opposite. Yeah. Okay. I went in for calcium. My blood sugar was like 41. Oh. Mm. So, yeah, I, I would be on the floor by then. So. Yes. Yeah. So, do you eat little eat meals all day? Yeah. Good stuff, right? I'd rather have his stuff than my stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'd rather his his stuff. I mean. <laughs> So I know one of the other ones would probably be the one that you just went through, which is the beautiful sugar water oh, that yeah. you get to drink. That's awesome. So you have the first one, which is kind of, it's built in with the um, 
with your screening. So usually they take your blood sugar, either we use like a little monitor, a little meter like this, and test your blood sugar. Um, or they will do it in the little machine we have now because they can do all of it at once. The, um, the fasting plasma FPG. That's usually what you do just with your with your finger stick. Um, another one would be the oral glucose tolerance test, which is one where they give you a little thing that looks like it should be like a Gatorade or maybe even Sprite. It does not taste like that. It's so gross. Huh. Um, and they like to do it when you're pregnant to make you want to throw up. Um, so you drink that, and they'll take your blood sugars. You should be fasting at least a 12-hour fast first. You drink that, they check it either one or two hours after, depending on how, how the test is, because there's a two-hour and a three-hour test, and see what your blood sugar does. Because as it goes into your system, like right now while you're eating for the next hour, it'll go up, 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 and then you'll start using that energy and it'll start coming down. So they want to see what your highest is and then when does it start coming down. Because it takes, like my blood sugar, a little while longer to actually come down um, than most. And then they have, anybody have had an A1C done? Okay. Do you know what the what the number represents? Three. No, but I, I know what the number. Mine was ridiculous at uh, fourteen. That is ridiculous at <laughs> <that> fourteen. <laughs> I, I, I got six weeks. Uh, you get it under seven, but also I got ten days with my sugar under two hundred. Okay. It never happens before. Always been four hundred, five hundred. Wow. And they're letting you try to do that on your own without medicine? No, I've got different medication. Okay. Right <laughs> I was like, wow, I that's a lot diet. to change. I've like, got 10 days. Okay. It's under 200, which is great. Okay, right. so now you have had 10 days. That's great. Especially if you're coming from four and 500s. Yeah, the A1C is a test that actually looks at the last three months of what your blood sugar does. It almost looks like just, it's a little machine as well. And it takes a little bit more blood. They put it in there and it kind of shakes up with solution and it comes out with a number and it tells you has your blood sugar really been on the higher end for at least three months because you might come in and have had a big dinner the night before you might have had you know tail there might have been you know whatever circumstance and it's a little bit higher well taking an a1c will tell you what the whole overview looks like um, for at least three months and that's a little more accurate that's what a lot of people look for and so you can use those for for most everything so this is what this is what we're talking about. So when our friend, is it George, is telling you his numbers over here, we want to see a fasting diet, a fasting sugar, if you're just doing a regular meter, under 100. So if that tells you kind of where we're, where we're at when we're talking about diabetes, you start looking at pre-diabetes somewhere where you're just a little bit over 100 when you're fasting a true like 12-hour fast, and then anything over 126 is when we start going, oh, what's going on? So that's through the finger stick. Um, this is more of when they do that sugary beverage, they actually do a full blood draw every time. So they uh, make sure that it's actually like a venipuncture. And then they want to see normal once you've taken it under 140. So that's a non-fasting result. We want to see less than 140. And then anything over 200 is almost like an automatic diagnosis. Um, and then this is the A1C. So normal is less than 5.7, um, and then you're kind of pre-diabetes in between, and usually anywhere between 6.5, especially 7 and above, um, is usually pretty much a, an immediate diagnosis as well. So um, those are the ways that they look at that, and a lot of times they'll do more than one of these. Like you go in and they're like, oh, you've done your screening, that's where your blood sugar's high. Then they'll have you do this test, and they usually follow up with the A1C and kind of keep an eye on that. So I have my A1C done every six months um, to see what's how I'm doing with my medications and everything. Does that make sense? Okay. Am I explaining these right? Can you kind of envision what I'm talking about? Okay. So I think they said with our screening, for those who are maybe at risk during the screening, they'll invite them to come back and do a follow-up rescreening. Is that the same kind of test, or would they move them up to the next type of test to see? Um, usually accurate? your physician will, like, if you have a primary care, they'll bring you in, and they if they have the A1C, because that is also like a little portable machine. They may do that in-house just to see what's going on. Um, and then if that's also up, then they'll probably send you to go ahead and do the full um, blood draw in that, in that one. But usually we send you to the primary care. I mean, we're the screening company, so sometimes sometimes physicians are perfectly fine with the screening company saying that there's an issue. And other times they want to recheck our work and might have you and just do a, a quick finger stick and make sure that the number was accurate and what we got. 
Because um, your blood sugar changes every minute, every second, depending on what you eat, whether you're fasting, non-fasting. Um, it can it can continually be rising from eating. It can be coming down. Um, so it's always different. And keep that in mind as well when we come for your screenings, what you're eating the night before, especially if you're going to be fasting, will still be in your system. So it's not the night to go and have like margaritas and beer and have your ice cream and all of that and then come in and go, oh, I forgot we had this today. Because it's probably still going to show up even if you don't have diabetes. So just keeping those things in mind, especially when you go get a full blood draw because your doctor should probably at least send you, send you once a year to get your cholesterol and your blood sugar and all of that as well. So we've kind of went over what diabetes is, the types, and um, how we're diagnosed. Any questions on any of that so far? So that's just kind of like the little overview of actual diabetes. Well, the diabetes test usually fasting beforehand? Yes. That's usually more of an accurate telling of what your body does. A lot of our bodies change once we eat anyways. So some people do skyrocket when they eat, but you will also be at, at fasting as well. And that's why they start there. They want to see when you have nothing in your system, what is your body doing? And a lot of times we're like already high for that. Um, like if you come into our screenings, we kind of have a conversation with you. If your numbers are below 200, if you're not diagnosed and it's 200, you get to call your doctor pretty much right away. If you are diagnosed and it's 300, we go ahead and call your doctor as well and make sure that you're going to follow up within a couple days. Because um, we'll get into kind of what that means and what it's doing to your body as well uh, if you're keeping your numbers that high. So I'm not the biggest fan of this slide, but it says living with diabetes isn't easy. It isn't easy, but it's not. Like when I was diagnosed, I had this like moment of, oh, wow, this is like the rest of my life. This is really rough. I already eat really well. I exercise. What am I going to do? You know, and I just felt very defeated by the diagnosis. But it really is something that's just part of your life and your lifestyle. And you kind of add it in just like anybody else. We all have our thing. This is just one of the things that we have to acknowledge and take care of. So it might not always be easy. But at the same time, I don't think it has to be difficult. It's just kind of your own mindset and how you look at it. And we have a lot of company. We have what? A lot of company? Yeah. 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 There's a lot of us. Yes. There's a lot of diabetics. So um, I just think it, it's just one of those things that you just take it head on and you figure it out with everything else that we you know go through. So where to start? So you probably start with your health care provider, whether that's your primary care. A lot of primary care physicians will go ahead and monitor that for you. Um, they also have endocrinologists. That's what I follow up with. I just feel a little, I love my endocrinologist, so I, I follow up with him because I wanted the diabetes education part of it. There is in their office usually a diabetes educator. So once you're diagnosed, They'll sit down with that. There's also a lot of programs through Florida Blue that's on that form. And on the back, there's a number and a, um, a next step coach and an email address um, that you can get diabetes education as well through them if you have Florida Blue. But I wanted that piece to it. So I sat down with um, the diabetes educator, and they went through exactly what does a diabetes plate look like? How many sugars can you have per meal? Because we were just kind of discussing that a little bit. Um, what can you have in a day? So I have learned that a snack needs to be under 15 grams of carbohydrates. I learned that my meal cannot be any more than 45 at any given time. That how much, you know, I look at it in small spurts like that, that your plate, if you kind of look at the plate, it's supposed to be half, yeah, look at your plate. It's supposed to be half veggies and fruits. A quarter of it's supposed to be your lean protein, and a quarter of it can be some of, you know, your whole grains. So that's how I envision almost everything I eat. I may choose differently, but I know I am because I know what it's supposed to look like. So we went through that. We went through how many carbs are in corn, how many carbs are in, because you think about it, and a lot of people say, I can't eat fruit high in sugar. Well, I'd rather you eat natural sugar and have fruit any day than the majority of the foods that we choose. So... Um, I kind of figured out, okay, if I'm going to have watermelon, I can't eat like half the watermelon I used to during the summer. You know, you pick or choose your one or two pieces and enjoy them um, and then move on to your salad or your protein. So um, it was, I do enjoy that. So if that's a side that you're more interested in, I would definitely follow up with the information that's either 
um, on the handout, or Brian can email it to you as well because he has that. Um, and then also, obviously, the glucose monitoring. So how often are you monitoring yours? Three times a day. Three times a day, okay. Uh, before breakfast, after breakfast, before lunch, and uh, bedtime. Bedtime, okay. So there's different, usually right in the beginning, they handed this to me and said, okay, five times a day is what I started with because they wanted to know fasting first thing in the morning, um, after an hour after breakfast, two hours after breakfast right before lunch, two hours after that. So like pretty much every meal I was doing it. Um, also as my best friend when I was pregnant because I had to turn in my numbers with that as well. Um, so it depends. Sometimes they'll send that home with you. They want to see what you're doing, what your meals like look like. Um, what I like when you're doing that as well is if you can meal log, if you write down what you're actually eating. So if you eat this and then in two hours you look at what your number is, you might realize, okay, my body doesn't tolerate cornbread as well as I thought it did. Or um, you might see that you had a salad and it didn't do as much. So it's good for us to kind of figure out what our bodies like and don't like as well. So quick poll, poll question. Raise your hand if you have a primary care doctor. That's a good question. Oh. Raise your hand if you go do your annual screening with them. You're already paying for it. It's free. <laughs> do your screening. Yeah, that one's an easy one because you are paying for it. You might as well go because um, they're going to take that money out of your check anyways. And they'll usually do all of your blood work. All of that's considered in that. Um, you know, if you're over 50, they usually will do the blood work for your PSA, all that fun stuff as well. So um, keep that in mind as you go to those. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very easy thing to do to find out and follow up with. How often do you check it now that you, I mean, because you are diagnosed, I mean, you don't have to check it as much. You I know. usually do it when, at first in the morning. I'm, I'm more worried usually at my fasting in the morning because that is a big indicator for me mm -hmm. on whether I've been following what I'm supposed to is or not. Is more like you take uh, like a pill, like a tablet? Yes. I take um, metformin, okay. which is the go-to usually for type 2 diabetes. So my it, grandmother had diabetes. She got diagnosed when she was 80. She lived to like 100. Yeah. Uh, and my brother is, he's on a home. Okay. So he, he got diagnosed when he was like 20. Wow. So type 1, usually if you're type 1, that goes more for a pump because you have to, it is, I don't want to say brittle, but it is constantly changing and you can fall, your, your sugars go up and down very quickly. So you have to adjust the amount of insulin in your body to take on how much you're eating. That one's a very, that one is very hard to to live with because you're looking at your food, you're going, okay, I think there's about 80 carbs in this meal, so I have to put that amount of insulin in to be able to fight it because they don't have any to start with. Um, type 2, I get to take two pills a day, and usually it helps my body utilize the sugar I already have um, because I just am not, um, my little receptors for insulin is not accepting the sugar, so I need it to understand that it's supposed to do that. So yes, it, each each kind is different. The way you handle it is different. So um, luckily, I I usually will check it once. Like last night, I checked when I got home from the Jags game because I really just wanted to know how bad it was. It's pretty rough. So um, I made sure that I had taken all my medicines that I'm supposed to and everything. And um, this morning, I had a higher protein breakfast and get back on my game, get it under control today. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not as is rough. Type 1, you just have to figure it out. But people that I know have it, that's just part of their life. It's part of what's attached to them and they get used to it. But um, So the goal of self-management. So this is like once you're diagnosed, what do you do? Um, you find like a partnership. Usually that's with your primary care or the people around you. That is what was my hardest thing when I was diagnosed, was honestly my in-laws. <laughs> my in-laws are very southern people and make very southern good casserole food and everything is in some kind of cream of something um, or crispy or fry, you know and so I literally was diagnosed and I was taking it in figuring it out I'm really not a bad eater but I was not really 100% aware of everything and carbs and all of that figuring it out they took us the next week for dinner for a celebration I think it was a birthday to beetroot chicken <laughs> Uh, I was like, all right, I love me some beetroot, but what the whole entire table is white. You get fried chicken, you get mashed potatoes, you get 
um, gravy to go with your fries and your biscuits, and, right? Like that is get cream peas. Like that is what. And I literally sat there and cried. My husband was like, "Are you okay?" And I said, "I can't eat any of this." Like I just had this full meltdown. And he was like, "You're okay?" And I said, "No, they don't understand." They do not understand that they, like, at my, that mindset right then was they are attempting to kill me because I cannot have this and this is the side effect. It took them years to understand that the side effect of what I ate at that moment is what it did to my body um, and that I was attempting to live as long as I can by not overworking my body. That extra sugar when I eat like that gets dispersed and it will affect my cholesterol, will get in my kidneys, will get in my heart, all of that and can cause such complications. Um, neuropathy, it gets um, into, your, into your nervous system and you can start not feeling your toes, your fingers, your ears. That's why people end up having all these issues. You end up stubbing your toe in something and you won't know. You end up having eye issues, you'll have glaucoma and you won't know, you don't feel it. Um, so that's, a, that's very extreme, but to me, that's what I felt like they were doing to me. And so now they laugh and they say, well, here's your green food. That's what they do. They make different dinner and they make me green food. And I'm like, thank you for not putting my green beans in something and just steaming them and giving them to me. Um, so that's one of the partnerships. Another one with that is that my dad was diagnosed at the same time. I thought we were going to hit this journey together. No, he still eats donuts every morning and just to make sure he takes plenty of medicine. And that is, that's, I, you know, obviously if that's what you want to, you're going to do, that's what you're going to do. But I thought, you know, I get over there and I'm like, okay, you know, this, and I'm like, what is all that? Little Debbie's still in the pantry, um, having his donuts for breakfast. He comes to my house and he goes, are you going to, he actually asked me before he comes in there, he goes, what are you making? Are you going to make me eat a vegetable? Yes. I can guarantee there will be a vegetable somewhere in this meal. And he... Yeah, and I think I think now they they invite us over to their house so that I won't make dinner because <laughs> that, that's just not what he wants. But I'm like, you are you're in this too. I, I know what's happening to you, and that it also breaks my heart because I don't want to see my dad eventually go down that route that he's kind of putting on himself. But at that point, he said, I can just take care of him. I was like, thanks, Dad. Um, but yeah, so you know, figure out your care team, what's going on, how you want to, you know, self manage it. It's really up to you. Diabetes is one of those things you see it in your family. You see it now before you even get there. What it looks like, you know, it kind of gives you an idea of what's happening. Um, it's up to you 100% on how you take care of that. A lot of pre-diabetes is by, our, by what we've done to ourselves. So for me, when I sit down and I get somebody, they always end up sitting with me or they send them to me because I can talk to them from heart to heart what it means to be diagnosed or what that what it looks like. And everybody's like, oh, that, that little girl. you know. I'm like, no, let me talk to you. Let me tell you what, what this is. And I'll sit down and I'll tell them, like, you have a choice. Like, you, I do not have a choice. Mine is going to be there. It has been there. I can't do anything about it. I will be on medication forever. I can work my tail off but I can keep it from getting worse. But when I look at people and I'm like, you have a choice not to have this and you can take care of it. Like I want them to feel that, that that's a self ownership a lot of times. So if you see those numbers coming in, if you know it, like that's when you start getting on it. That's when you start, cause really type two is the one that we, we deal with a lot. Um, that's my soapbox, sorry, but <laughs> it's, it's just one of those things that I want people to feel like they can take control, that you're able to, to do it on your own. It's these small things, healthy eating, being active, monitoring, so don't skip your annuals, Come like because that's the biggest one is that people go, I didn't know my numbers were that bad. When was the last time you had them taken? I don't even remember. I don't know. I haven't been to my doctor in five years, you know, and then it shows up. So... That's a, this is the time. Go at least every year. Come through your screening if you're not willing to make the doctor's appointment and make sure at least you're at a good spot there. Um, taking medications. I had someone the other day saying, coming into your screening, that is not the day to forget your blood pressure medication. <laughs> um, but people don't take their meds. And they said, well, I thought it would be okay. I thought it would be better. I could do it without it. Well, then, you know, do that with your doctor. That's between you and your doctor. Take those medications. Problem solving, that's kind of something we're going to talk about in a minute, but that's really in your head, just how we're talking, 
the problem solving of, well, the cornbread is probably better than the white bread, and this corn is better than getting the mashed potatoes, you know, those kind of problem solvings. Reducing your risks, taking away maybe some of those things that you really do know are bad for you that you can't get, like if it's in your house, you're going to eat it kind of thing. Make sure those are treats. Make sure they're not sitting in your house. Um, and then healthy coping, once you are diagnosed, taking care of it. Any questions so far? Any comments? All right. Ooh, <laughs> Everyone's like, yes, now I, here's ice cream. No. So, this. the fruits and vegetables, right? Yes, you got your. You got the fruit. You got your fruit. That's like 50%, right? You got your little dairy in there. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> so pretty much this is this is a little story. So it says um, two friends go out for a banana split. One has diabetes and the other doesn't. Before the one with diabetes starts eating, she says she needs to check blood sugar. The friend says she wants to check as well. So they both oddly have the same blood sugar of 95. They eat the banana split, and two hours later they both check again. One is 102 and the other is 222. <laughs> what causes that difference in the numbers? The pancreas is working on one and not in the other one. Okay. She doesn't have enough insulin to counteract the sugars. Yes. Why? Because one of the, um, the one with the higher number has cells that are very deep that are not accepting the sugar. Mm. You guys are so smart. You got the right answer. You didn't give me the answers they told me you would. <laughs> so that's one of the things that usually people will blame the sugar. They'll say they had too much sugar. Well, it and you guys didn't. Um, it actually is the pancreas's fault, not not the sugar. So it's a matter of how your body accepts that when it is an actual diagnosis of being diabetic. It's not that you took in too much sugar. It's that your body is now um, not accepting it. So what are some of the things, like, if you wanted to go out and have banana split, whether you're diabetic or not, what are some ways that you can do it in a healthy way? Sugar-free ice cream. Sugar-free ice cream? Okay. <laughs> All right, so if the sugar-free ice cream is not worth it, then what do you do? Cut that for you. Eat half of it. Half of it. Cut it down. Yes. My brother just wants some more. Take more medicine. <laughs> yeah, and also with a lot of these places, the amount of toppings you have, we don't think about those too. So especially if you go to one of those frozen yogurt places and they have the whole entire bar of all the stuff you can yes. put on top, you know, and it weighs more because you have more toppings than you do ice cream, that's where we get in trouble as well. So cutting back maybe on what's on there, sharing um, if you do have to get the entire thing. Um, I even like the one skip or just decrease the size of the banana. So I guess cut it in half. Um, but yeah, because you know bananas have a lot of sugar in them too. So these are just little things that your brains are working correctly because you guys are all kind of thinking that way now versus just oh there's just too much sugar. But how can we can we you know deal with that? But yeah, a lot of it it does come down to um, what we eat and what we um, our our choices and our everyday. So do we have any questions? What was the other question? Oh, you asked me about. Weight. So a lot of times we follow the BMI chart, which is your body mass index. Um, it's your height versus your weight. And a lot of times we look at that, we want to technically less than 24.9 is where you want to be in that. Um, with age, it goes up a little bit more. You get a little bit more leeway, but that's usually not until over 65. Uh, and then on top of that, waist measurement is huge when it comes for diabetes because sugar sits here. It just sits right here. Like that's why we always hear about the beer belly, that kind of thing, because those extra carbs sit right here. Um, so usually men need to be under 40. Now think, your weight, your pant size is not the same as your waist measurement. A lot of people say, like, my, I wear this though, but right here, belly button all the way around is your waist, and under 40 is, is usually the healthy. All right, so how many people have prediabetes? 85. 87 million? 86 million. 86. 86. Uh, <laughs> I was like, that's really close, but... You got it, Chris? And if you won once, you can't win again. That we'll, spread the, we'll spread the love. All right. You ready? All hands up. Okay. Which type of diabetes does not produce enough insulin? 
Type one. Type one. Good job. Nailed it. All right. What is a normal fasting blood sugar? What is it supposed to be? Under 100. Yes. Do you get your own dollar? <laughs> the next person gets two. How about that? Oh, devil. Yeah. Devil here. Yeah, All right. One. How much exercise should you be getting in a week? Um, 30, five days, 30 minutes. Good job. You get breakfast club. <laughs> you got to buy some, some good food with that. Delivery fee. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last, I guess last question. What part of the body produces insulin? <laughs> right. So that's throw it first. He had his hand up first. All right, coming down. I mean, this one's unless you guys want to fight over the dollar. All right, well, that's pretty much what I have. Make sure that you are signed in. Um, that we got everybody. Know how yep. many we have. 13. Yeah. Yep, and then if, I, if you have any questions or anything, I'll stick around for a few minutes, and we're good to go. Thank you guys you so are much. a fun group. Thank you. Thank you.